just as pollution was a side effect of the Industrial Revolution, so are the many security vulnerabilities that come with the increased internet connectivity. Cyber attacks are exploitations of those vulnerabilities. For the most part, individuals and businesses have found ways to counter cyber attacks using a variety of security measures and just good old common sense. We are going to examine eight of the most common cybersecurity threats that your business could face and the ways to avoid them. So before we actually jump into the session, let me give you how the session will actually work. We are going to discuss the most eight common cyber threats. We're going to discuss in particular what they are, how the threat works and how to protect yourself. OK, so now let's jump in. Now cyber attacks are taking place all the time. Even as we speak, the security of some organization, big or small, is being compromised. For example, if you visit this site out here that is Threat Cloud, you can actually view all the cyber attacks that are actually happening right now. Let me just give you a quick demonstration of how that looks like. Okay, so as you guys can see out here, these are all the places that are being compromised right now. The red parts actually show us the part that is being compromised and the yellow places actually show us from where it's being compromised from. Okay, as you guys can see now that Someone from the Netherlands is actually attacking this place and someone from USA was attacking Mexico. It's a pretty interesting site and actually gives you a scale of how many cyber attacks are actually happening all the time in the world. Okay, now getting back, I think looking at all these types of cyber attacks, it's only necessary that we educate ourselves about all the types of cyber threats that we have. So these are the eight cyber threats that we're gonna be discussing today. Firstly, we're gonna start with malware. So. Malware is an all encompassing term for a variety of cyber attacks, including Trojans, viruses, and worms. Malware is simply defined as code with malicious intent that typically steals data or destroys something on the computer. The way malware goes about doing its damage can be helpful in categorizing what kind of malware you're dealing with. So let's discuss it. So first of all, viruses. Like their biological namesakes, viruses attach themselves to clean files and infect other clean files, and they can spread uncontrollably, damaging a system's core functionality and deleting or corrupting files. They usually appear as executable files that you might have downloaded from the internet. Then there are also Trojans. Now, this kind of malware disguises itself as legitimate software or is included in legitimate software that can be tampered with. It tends to act discreetly and creates backdoors in your security to let other malwares in. Then we have worms. Worms infect entire networks of devices, either local or across the internet, by using the network's interfaces. It uses each consecutive infected machine to infect more. And then we have botnets and such, where botnets are networks of infected computers that are made to work together under the controller of an attacker. So basically, you can encounter malware if you have some OS vulnerabilities, or if you download some illegitimate software from somewhere, or you have some other email attachment that was compromised with. Okay, so how exactly do you remove malware or how exactly do you fight against it? Well, each form of malware has its own way of infecting and damaging computers and data. And so each one requires a different malware removal method. The best way to prevent malware is to avoid clicking on links or downloading attachments from unknown senders. And this is sometimes done by deploying a robust and updated firewall, which prevents the transfer of large data files over the network in a hope to weed out attachments that may contain malware. It's also important to make sure your computer's operating system, whether it be Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uses the most up-to-date security updates. And software programmers update programs frequently to address any holes or weak points. And it's important to install all these updates as well as to decrease your own system weaknesses. So next up on our list of cyber threats, we have phishing. So what exactly is phishing? Well, often posing as a request for data from a trusted third party, Phishing attacks are sent via email and ask users to click on a link and enter their personal data. Phishing emails have gotten much more sophisticated in recent years and making it difficult for some people to discern a legitimate request for an information from a false one. Now, phishing emails often fall into the same category as spam, but are way more harmful than just a simple ad. So how exactly does phishing work? Well, most people associate phishing with email message that spoof or mimic bank, credit card companies, or other businesses like Amazon, eBay, and Facebook. These messages look authentic and attempt to get victims to reveal their personal information. But email messages are only one small piece of a phishing scam. From beginning to end, the process involves five steps. The first step is planning. The phisher must decide which business to target and determine how to get email addresses 
for the customers of that business. Then they must go through the setup phase. Once they know which business to spoof and who their victims are, fishers create methods for delivering the messages and collecting the data. Then they have to execute the attack. And this is the step most people are familiar with. That is the fisher sends a phony message that appears to be from a reputable source. After that, the fisher records the information the victims enter into the web page or pop up windows. And in the last step, which is basically identity theft and fraud, the fishers use the information they've gathered to make illegal purchases or otherwise commit fraud. And as many as a fourth of the victims never fully recover. So how exactly can you be actually preventing yourself from getting fished? Well, the only thing that you can do is being aware of how phishing emails actually work. So first of all, a phishing email has some very specific properties. So firstly, you will have something like a very generalized way of addressing someone like dear client. Then your message will not be actually from a very reputable source. So out here, as you can see, it's written as Amazon on the label. But if you actually inspect the email address that it came from, it's from management at MaisonCanada.ca, which is not exactly a legitimate Amazon address. Third, you can actually hover over the redirect links and see where they actually redirect you to. Now, this redirects me to www.fakeamazon.com, as you can see out here. So basically, you know, this is actually a phishing email and you should actually report this email to your administrators or anybody else that you think is supposed to be concerned with this. Also, let me give you guys a quick demonstration on how phishing actually works from the perspective of an attacker. So first of all, I have actually created a phishing website for harvesting Facebook credentials. I simply just took the source code of the Facebook login page and pasted it and then made a backend code in PHP, which makes a log file of all the Facebook passwords that get actually entered onto the phishing page. Now, I've also sent myself an email as to make sure this looks legitimate, but this is only for spreading awareness. So please don't use this method for actually harvesting credentials. That's actually a very illegal thing to do. So let's get started. First of all, You'll go to your email and see that you'll get some email saying your Facebook credentials have been compromised. So when you open it, it looks pretty legit. Well, I haven't made it look all that legit. It should look legit, but the point out here is to actually make you aware of how this works. So as you guys can see, it says, dear client, we have strong reasons to believe that your credentials may have been compromised and might have been used by someone else. We have locked your Facebook account. Please click here to unlock. Sincerely, Facebook associate team. So if we actually click here, we are actually redirected to a nice looking Facebook page, which is exactly how Facebook looks like when you're logging in. Now, suppose I were to actually log into my Facebook account, which I won't, I'll just use some random ID, like this is an email, gmail.com and let's put password as admin123, and we click login. Now, since my Facebook is actually already logged in, it'll just redirect to facebook.com and you might just see me logged in. But on a normal computer, it'll just redirect you to www.facebook.com, which should just show this site again. Okay, so once I click login out here, all that the backend code that I've written in PHP out here will do is that it's going to take all the parameters that I've entered into this website, that is my email address and the password and just generate a log file about it. So let's just hit login and see what happens. So as you guys can see, I've been redirected to the original Facebook page that is not meant for phishing. And on my system out here, I have a log file. And this log file will show exactly, as you can see, I've fished out the email address. This is an email at the gmail.com. And it's also showed the password that is admin123. So this is how exactly phishing works. You enter an email address and you're entering the email address on a phishing website and then it just redirects you to the original site. But by this time you've already compromised your credentials. So always be careful when dealing with such emails. So now jumping back to our session, the next type of cyber attacks we're going to discuss is password attacks. So an attempt to obtain or decrypt a user's password for illegal use is exactly what a password attack is. Hackers can use cracking programs, dictionary attacks, and password sniffers in password attacks. Password cracking refers to various measures used to discover computer passwords. This is usually accomplished by recovering passwords from data stored in 
or transported from a computer system. Password cracking is done by either repeatedly guessing the password, usually through a computer algorithm in which the computer tries numerous combinations until the password is successfully discovered. Now, password attacks can be done for several reasons, but the most malicious reason is in order to gain unauthorized access to a computer with the computer's owner's awareness not being in place. Now, this results in cybercrime, such as stealing passwords for the purpose of accessing bank information. Now, today, there are three common methods used to break into a password protected system. The first is a brute force attack. A hacker uses a computer program or script to try to log in with possible password combinations, usually starting with the easiest to guess password. So just think if a hacker has a company list, he or she can easily guess usernames. If even one of the users has a password 123, he will quickly be able to get in. The next are dictionary attacks. Now a hacker uses a program or script to try to log in by cycling through the combinations of common words. In contrast with brute force attacks where a large proportion key space is searched systematically, a dictionary attack tries only those possibilities which are most likely to succeed, typically derived from a list of words, for example, a dictionary. Generally, dictionary attacks succeed because most people have a tendency to choose passwords which are short or such as single words found in the dictionaries or simple easy predicted variations on words such as appending a digit or so. Now, the last kind of password attacks are used by keylogger attacks. A hacker uses a program to track all of the user's keystrokes. So at the end of the day, everything the user has typed, including the login IDs and passwords, have been recorded. A keylogger attack is different than a brute force or dictionary attack in many ways, not the least of which the key logging program used is a malware that must first make it onto the user's device. And the keylogger attacks are also different because stronger passwords don't provide much protection against them, which is one reason that multi-factor authentication is becoming a must-have for all businesses and organizations. Now, the only way to stop yourself from getting killed in the whole password attack conundrum is by actually practicing the best practices that are being discussed in the whole industry about passwords. So basically, you should update your password regularly. You should use alphanumerics in your password, and you should never use words that are actually in the dictionary. It's always advisable to use garbage words that make no sense for passwords as they just increase your security. So moving on, we're going to discuss DDoS attacks. So what exactly is a DDoS or a DOS attack? Well, first of all, it stands for distributed denial of service and a DOS attack focuses on disrupting the service to a network as the name suggests. Attackers send high volume of data of traffic through the network until the network becomes overloaded and can no longer function. So there are a few different ways attackers can achieve DOS attack, but the most common is the distributed denial of service attack. This involves the attacker using multiple computers to send the traffic or data that will overload the system. In many instances, a person may not even realize that his or her computer has been hijacked and is contributing to the DOS attack. Now, disrupting services can have serious consequences relating to security and online access. Many instances of large scale DOS attacks have been implemented as a single sign of protest towards governments or individuals and have led to severe punishment, including major jail time. So how can you prevent DOS attacks against yourself? Well, firstly, unless your company is huge, it's rare that you would be even targeted by an outside group or attackers for a DOS attack. Your site or network could still fall victim to one. However, if another organization on your network is targeted. Now, the best way to prevent an additional breach is to keep your system as secure as possible with regular software updates, online security monitoring, and monitoring of your data flow to identify any unusual or threatening spikes in traffic before they become a problem. DOS attacks can also be perpetrated by simply cutting a table or dislodging a plug that connects your website server to the internet. So due diligence in physically monitoring your connections is recommended as well. Okay, so next up on our list is man in the middle attacks. So by impersonating the endpoints in an online information exchange, the man in the middle attack can obtain information from the end user and the entity he or she is communicating with. For example, if you are banking online, the man in the middle would communicate with you by impersonating your bank and communicate with the bank by impersonating you. The man in the middle would then receive all of the information transferred between both parties, which could include sensitive data such as bank accounts and personal information. So how does it exactly work? Normally, an MITM gains access through a non-encrypted wireless access point which is basically one that doesn't use WAP, WPA, or any of the other security measures. 
then they would have to access all of the information being transferred between both parties by actually spoofing something called address resolution protocol. That is the protocol that is used when you are actually connecting to your gateway from your computer. So how can you exactly prevent MITM attacks from happening against you? So firstly, you have to use an encrypted WAP. That is an encrypted wireless access point. Next, you should always check the security of your connection because when somebody is actually trying to compromise your security, he will try to actually strip down the HTTPS or HSTS that is being injected in the website, which is basically the security protocols. So if something like this HTTPS is not appearing in your website, you're on an insecure website where your credentials or your information can be compromised. And the last and final measure that you can actually use is by investing in a virtual private network, which spoofs your entire IP and you can just browse the internet with perfect comfort. Next up on our list is drive by downloads. So gone are the days where you had to click to accept a download or install a software update in order to become infected. Now just opening a compromised web page could allow dangerous code to install on your device. You just need to visit or drive by a web page without stopping or to click accept any software and the malicious code can download in the background to your device. A drive by download refers to the unintentional download of a virus or malicious software onto your computer or mobile device. A drive by download will usually take advantage or exploit a browser or app or operating system that is out of date and has security flaws. This initial code that is downloaded is often very small. And since its job is often simply to contact another computer where it can pull down the rest of the code onto your smartphone, tablet, or other computers. Often a web page will contain several different types of malicious code in hopes that one of them will match a weakness on your computer. So how does this exactly work? Well, first you visit the site and during the three way handshake connection of the TCP IP protocol, a backend script is triggered. As soon as a connection is made while the last ACK packet is sent, a download is also triggered and the malware is basically injected into your system. Now the best advice I can share about avoiding drive by downloads is to avoid visiting websites that could be considered dangerous or malicious. This includes adult content, file sharing websites, or anything that offers you a free trip to the Bahamas. Now some other tips to stay protected include keep your internet browser and operating system up to date. Use a safe search protocol that warns you when to navigate to a malicious site and use comprehensive security software on all your devices like McAfee All Access and keeping it up to date. Okay, so that was it about drive-by downloads. Next up is maladvertising or malvertising. So malvertising is the name we in the security industry give to criminally controlled advertisements which intentionally infect people and businesses. These can be any ad on any site, often ones which you use as a part of your everyday internet usage, and it is a growing problem as is evident by a recent US Senate report and the establishment of bodies like trust in ads. Now, whilst the technology being used in the background is very advanced, the way it presents to the person being infected is simple. To all intents and purposes, the advertisement looks the same as any other, but has been placed by criminal. Like you can see the mint ad out here, it's really out of place, so you could say it's been made by a criminal. Now, without your knowledge, a tiny piece of code hidden deep in the advertisement is making your computer go to the criminal servers. These then catalog details about your computer and its location before choosing which piece of malware to send you. And this doesn't need a new browser window and you won't know about it. So basically you're redirected to some criminal server. The malware injection takes place and voila, you're infected. It's a pretty dangerous thing to be in. So how exactly can you stop malvertising? Well, first of all, you need to use an ad blocker, which is a very must in this day and age. You can have ad blocker extensions installed on your browser, whether it be Chrome, Safari, or Mozilla. Also, regular software updates of your browser and other softwares that work peripheral to your browser always help. And next is some common sense. Any advertisement that is about a lottery that's offering you free money is probably going to scam you and inject a malware too. So never click on those ads. So the last kind of cyber attacks we are going to discover today and discuss about is rogue software. So rogue security software is a form of malicious software and internet fraud that misleads users into believing that there is a virus on their computer and manipulates them into paying money for a fake malware removal tool. 
It is a form of scareware that manipulates users through fear and a form of ransomware. Rogue security software has been a serious security threat in desktop computing since 2008. So now, how does a rogue security software work? These scams manipulating users into download the program through a variety of techniques. Some of these methods include ads offering free or trial versions of security programs, often pricey upgrades, or encouraging the purchase of the deluxe versions. Then also pop-ups warning that your computer is infected with a virus, which encourages you to clean it by clicking on the program. And then manipulated SEO rankings that put infected website as the top hits when you search. These links then redirect you to a landing page that claims your machine is infected and encourages you a free trial of the rogue security program. Now, once the scareware is installed, it can steal all your information, slow your computer, corrupt your files, disable updates for legitimate antivirus software, or even prevent you from visiting legitimate security software vendor sites. Well, talking about prevention, the best defense is a good offense. And in this case, an updated firewall makes sure that you have a working one in your office that protects you and your employees from these type of attacks. It is also a good idea to install a trusted antivirus or anti spyware software program that can detect threats like these. And also a general level of distrust on the internet and not actually believing anything right off the bat is the way to go. Clean is infected and encourages you a free trial of the rogue security program. Now, once the scareware is installed, it can steal all your information, slow your computer, corrupt your files, disable updates for legitimate antivirus software, or even prevent you from visiting legitimate security software vendor sites. Well, talking about prevention, the best defense is a good offense. And in this case, an updated firewall makes sure that you have a working one in your office that protects you and your employees from these type of attacks. It is also a good idea to install a trusted antivirus or anti spyware software program that can detect threats like these. And also a general level of distrust on the internet and not actually believing anything right off the bat is the way. Subscribe now and hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest cybersecurity videos, empowering you to navigate the digital landscape securely. Don't let cyber threats compromise your online experience. Arm yourself with knowledge and become a vigilant digital citizen.